Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. On today's installment, as we have done each of the last two years, we will be replaying excerpts from some of our favorite episodes throughout the year, giving listeners just a taste of the knowledgeable guests we hosted in 2022. First, you'll hear our chief futurist, Brett Witten, and our autonomous and robotics director of research, Sam Corris, interview Shift4 Payments CEO and chairman, Jared Isaacman. Brett, Sam, and Jared discuss the Polaris Dawn mission, Jared's passion for spaceflight to further human space exploration, and some of the tangible philosophies that he took from SpaceX. After that, Next Generation Internet Director of Research, Frank Downing, and Associate Portfolio Manager, Nick Groose, sit down with Polygon Studios CEO, Ryan Wyatt, to unpack the future of Web3 games and digital ownership. Ryan also comments more generally on the buy-in to decentralization, interoperability concerns, and his perspective on the realities of the metaverse. Then, analyst Mac Friedrich and William Summerlin talk to Titan co-founders and co-CEOs Joe Percoco and Clay Gardner about their mission to personalize private wealth. In that episode, you'll hear how Joe and Clay met and founded their online investment platform, their mission and vision, how they remove the middleman in hedge fund-like investing, and more. Next, analyst Ali Ehrman and ARC advisor Dr. Charlie Roberts are joined by MIT professor, chemical engineer, scientist, inventor, and investor, Dr. Bob Langer. Dr. Langer has over 1,400 granted or pending patents, has been cited 375,000 times and counting, and was a co-founder of Moderna. In the episode, Ali, Dr. Roberts, and Dr. Langer discuss emerging biotechnologies, the potential of artificial intelligence in healthcare, and time-to-market accelerators for new therapies and vaccines. And finally, we want to highlight last week's episode with Steve Case. Steve is one of America's most renowned entrepreneurs as a co-founder of AOL. Currently, Steve serves as chairman and CEO of Revolution LLC, which focuses on investing in the next generation of founders, especially in the 47 states outside of California, New York, and Massachusetts. In the episode, Steve and ARC's CEO, Kathy Wood, discuss why he thinks entrepreneurs are vital, the value of research toward innovation, and why Steve is optimistic for the future of America. While we are highlighting just five of our guests in this final episode of 2022, We wanted to thank all of the fantastic innovators that shared their stories and provided their expert insight into each of their fields on the For Your Innovation podcast this past year. Thank you all for listening to today's episode and for listening to FYI all year. We hope you and your loved ones are having a very happy holiday season, and we wish you a happy new year. We'll see you in 2023. Space, Business, and the Business of Space with Jared Isaacman from Shift4 Payments, episode 127. And you mentioned like, you know, these basically private enterprises required to capitalize these types of initiatives, which, which I agree with. And it's hard, you know, Sam's job and, and my job partly is to like, think of all the crazy things that can happen out of the fact that we have reusable rockets and with reusable rockets in particular, it's kind of like, yes, it would be good for the world for life to be multi-planetary, but it's not as clear how you could privately capitalize such a venture unless you know, SpaceX can make so much money off Starlink that they can inject that capital successfully into sending, you know, missions out there. If you had to guess what business models arise from reusable rockets, are there additional business models you can think of? Or is it kind of like you just need to make the leap and start a colony? Your question is the right one, right? Um, You better have like a Starlink and a lot of resources to pay for a trip to Mars because 
not quite sure exactly when we get there um, what the, the economy is to justify the extraordinary Manhattan Project level investment to do so, other than it's probably a good thing for humankind in, in the super grand scheme of things, right? But every single thing that SpaceX builds along the way can be monetized and opens up new opportunities. Like right now, the KPI is just you know your cost uh, per kilogram uh, accelerating it to orbit. It's dropped a lot thanks to SpaceX. Like it can drop materially, and once you do that, you really don't know what is in the realm of possible, right? I I don't think you're going to have like these massive tourist flights of people on starships taking pictures, you know, going from point A to B in you know 45 minutes. I, I don't think that's that's what the economy is. Do I, I do think people will be working in low Earth orbit. I do think you can have a manufacturing capability in low Earth orbit. I think you can expand science. I mean, geez, the list is like is probably 10 miles long for getting experiments on the International Space Station. They have to be super selective of what goes up. There's only so many people that can even manage the experiments up there. When you can bring down costs, like, materially to the point where, let's just say, you know, biotechs and pharmaceutical companies can afford it, you don't know what's potentially possible, right? I mean, we've come a very long way, you know, from the infrastructure investments to allow rich Wall Street types to have a car phone in the 1980s, what, like, mobile mobile technology has to offer to the world today, uh, where it's not uncommon for like your average 12 year old to have a smartphone and, and buy a bunch of apps and such. So like you got to get that cost down or you're, you're going to just limit the amount of possibilities that happen. Starship is going to be a total game changer in the ability to put mass and accelerate into orbit. And from there, you know, again, it's just, there's, there's so many possibilities that could come from it. Are you thinking low G manufacturing for like actually to bring product back to earth? Is that what you're implying? Or just to create more, I guess, infrastructure and tooling for outbound exploration? Well, look, I, I'd say like the moment you create, you know, low cost mass production capabilities of starships, almost to the point that they could, you know, even though they're reusable, they could almost essentially be disposable too. And that you could put up 20 of them and just dock them and have essentially like a city uh, in low earth orbit if every one of them has the potential of maybe like it's high density configuration is a hundred. So let's just say it's like 20, you could really populate a lot of people on orbit. Then what are they doing up there? Like what was worth the investment? Well, first, we don't know if it was actually even that big of an investment at that point in time. It might actually be like very reasonable to get up there. And then what, be- what can you accomplish in microgravity better than what you could potentially do, you know, here on earth? I think that remains to be seen because you've just had so so little opportunities to test up there. I mean, again, it's only a select few experiments periodically make their way up to the International Space Station. But we'll find out, right? I mean, we we certainly weren't going to find out when it was $250 million every time you put a a satellite up. Um, But now we've got CubeSats up, and it's it's, it's just changing quite rapidly. But I agree with you. Like, fundamentally, we have to answer the question on, like, what that economy looks like in order to justify some of the more, like, extraordinary investments. But fortunately, like, it's not like SpaceX is oblivious to this either. Like, that's where Starlink does come in. And I would say they will be the, the category leader in payload to low Earth orbit for uh, quite some time. To me, it seems as if for, you have to cross, cross some kind of price threshold for Mars. I think Elon said this, where it's basically somebody can give up on Earth, sell their house, and try to become a colonist and make their fortune on the march. And so, so there is you know, some like taking of capital in the U.S. that would go into people like paying for the journey out there, even if it's a one-way trip, but we're still a long way. Yeah, I don't even, I prefer to just keep it at the, uh, let's just reduce the cost of getting mass to low Earth orbit and let the possibilities kind of span from there. Because once you start talking about, like SpaceX can't solve everything for Mars. And believe me, long before somebody's selling their house here and deciding to like colonize Mars, there are social and psychological issues that, you know, have not been sorted out yet. Space, just even low Earth orbit, could come with a lot of stress. I mean, physiologically, everyone, 100% of people feel different when you're on orbit. And there have been challenges throughout human spaceflight. Uh, And you're essentially, call it uh, hours from coming home safely from the space station. You're two and a half days uh, to come home safely from the moon. You're nine months every couple of years to come home from Mars. And it is a spec like long before we figure out how people are going to make a living uh, on Mars, we have to make sure they don't lose their mind on Mars uh, as well. So there's a lot that needs to be figured out. And it's, again, it's, it, SpaceX can't solve all these things, 
But believe me, once we start shifting the conversation there, there's a, there's a lot of you know, questions to still be solved. And there's no analogs here on Earth or throughout human history. Like you can't, not, not crossing the Atlantic uh, during the, you know, the Renaissance or the age of exploration, not Antarctica, like there are no, there are no analogs. Fitting, Brett, to what you're saying, I think just today they, they found Shackleton's ship, Endurance. So similar journey as, as uh, Musk has put it. In a way, though, right? Because, um, you know, you have water, you can fish. You know, if you came across the Atlantic, you generally know that with wood, you can build a, a house. And if you're successful trading anything, you can reward yourself by maybe building a bigger house. Um, you know, you can buy more cattle. Like there are some things that are just totally like for like, even if you're going into a strange land on here on Earth, you could spend your whole life on Mars um, doing what's in the best interest of the, of the colony and you still live in your same dome. You're not going to go outside and chop down more trees to build yourself a nicer dome. There are no real analogs, uh, you know, kind of whatsoever. But that doesn't mean it shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't stop us from, you know, taking these kind of bold steps that are, are probably, again, in the best interest of humankind. Is this kind of cautionary tone uh, inspired by your inspiration for mission? Did you almost lose your mind while you were in orbit? Oh, no. I'm quite sure, like... Uh, we, we were pretty well monitored, uh, like psychological training was part of it. Uh, I'm quite sure they would not allow me back up if I did. No, I, I'm actually just kind of just, you know, sharing from my, my education experience. And it is that, um, uh, I mean, 50% of people have uh, space adaptation syndrome on orbit. Uh, doesn't matter you, who you are. You could be a great fighter pilot and fly upside down all the time. And you won't feel so great for a bit. Um, and throughout the entire duration on orbit, just based on lack of gravity and fluid shifts, you'll feel different. So it's not the same as, you know, taking off an airplane and kind of clearing the pressure, you know, build up and, uh, and everything's fine. It's a, it's a little bit uh, different, but it's not meant to like slow down progress. It's actually just more meant to highlight the things that need consideration while we're in parallel, while SpaceX, uh, you know, brings all this fun sci-fi back to, to reality. The future of Web3 games and digital ownership with Polygon Studios CEO, Ryan Wyatt, episode 146 kind of get people aligned on, on what Polygon's future is going to look like. In terms of maybe summarizing and, and asking a question here. So you see, you know, Polygon has a technical implementation built out. As you mentioned, that's kind of the hard part of the, you know, the, the product roadmap. So in terms of Polygon Studios and, and what you're building in the studio segment, what does that product roadmap look like? You talked about NFTs. You have mentioned gaming a few times. Like, What exactly are the businesses that you're going after to try to attract them into this Web3 ecosystem? We aren't building any products on the Polygon Studio side, right? Like, We basically are at service to getting people on the POS chain, getting people on our supernets, getting people integrated on our ZK event. And when you ask like who's people, it's you know it's the tooling, it's whether it's marketplaces, it's wallets, developer ecosystem, it's liquidity, right? It's all of these different things. And so, you know, our team is making sure when you want to build on Polygon, you've got somebody you can talk to to help do that, right? Whether it's as simple as like, hey, we need help with you know, you know looking at our smart contracts or you know our token designer. Hey, you know we're making a game. What are your thoughts on you know rolling out our NFT strategy this way versus this way, right? And so basically, that's what we, we are, are, are truly just the business function of Polygon and everything that it takes to kind of run that. We actually, Studios is kind of a funny name because we're not really a studio. We're not making any games in-house. We're not, genera- we're not creating any kind of IP in-house. And that's very intentional because I would never want to see us be at odds with any of the people that are building. So like, say we had a studio where we were making an MMORPG at Polygon Studios. I would look at it as like other MMORPGs that want to be on Polygon would be like, are they really going to act in my best interest to make sure that our game is really successful on Polygon? Are they going to make sure their game continues to be successful? And so there might be a time in the future where Polygon does do some of these things in-house. I would never rule it out. But right now, I you know, the, the focus of the company is to be obsessive over developers. And anything that you're doing that distracts you from that is a disservice to the advancement of the ecosystem from my perspective. And so everything we should be doing is how do you help developers? How do you give them scale resources, doing hackathons? How do you market? How do you promote them? How do you make sure that they're getting all of the like materials that they need to iterate on their, on their business model? Fund them on the venture side, right? Um, you know, give grants out, right? So everything is focused on supporting developers building on Polygon, whether it's DeFi, games, 
an NFT project or Facebook. Got it. And that fits very much with the, the ethos of Web3, right? You're wanting to support this decentralized developer network with the helping hand, which is now Polygon Studios. So maybe, maybe let me reframe the question I asked you then. What are developers building for Polygon that you're seeing come through Polygon Studios? What has been kind of the, the biggest draw for developers uh, uh, you know, using Polygon? I think we've been the most successful at bringing web two companies in. So it's different. It depends on like what group we're talking about. I think we've been the most successful bringing web two companies to web three for a couple reasons. One, I think they quickly come to the same conclusion around Ethereum that we do, right? Where it's like, okay, that's a proven, like that has, that has legs, that has history, that has users, that has liquidity, that has developers. There's a lot of traction on Ethereum. So that may, and like the other, these other L1s haven't been around for a while, so we don't know. So, it's, you know, we'll attach to that idea. And then it's like, okay, let's evaluate how best to build on Ethereum and then look at the offerings that you have across that. And so then I think they come to Polygon because if you look at the kind of executive team we've brought in, you know, it's people, you know, 20 years at EA, you know, 10 years at Unity, eight years running marketing at Facebook. Like we've got really great kind of web two, web three hybrid executives. And so we have, a, I think, a BD team that knows what good looks like and how to operate at a high level. And I think people, you know, like to associate with that and it gives comfort knowing that you've got a strong partnership because you're going to be working for many years together. And I think the last part is, you know, our, kind of our, our carbon footprint narrative where we're carbon neutral, right, in doing, you know, carbon uh, credit offsets. And so I think when people think about really what's important if you're going to build on chain is doing it in a sustainable way. And so when you kind of look at it, they're like, Boom, right? That's why we'll choose Polygon. Now, what is starting to happen is a, is a significant snowball effect because then you're like, well, Stripe, HTC, DraftKings, Reddit, Facebook, they're all on Polygon. And yeah, so you know, they're ob you know, Reddit obviously is a multi-chain and some of these will continue to be multi-chain. But a very consistent theme is Polygon is part of that strategy, right? And I do think the world will be multi-chain and I think that's okay, right? I think that's not a bad thing. But I think Polygon will continue to be a part of all of this. And so I think that's the Web 2 reason. I think Web 3 is very similar, though, in nature, why, why, you know, why they're building on Polygon as well. And we have a games team. I also think we have, you know, when you think about the, bat, like the people we've hired from the games industry, when you are in game development, you want to work with people that know and have been a part of the games ecosystem. And there's a bunch of different ways, whether it's like on the platform side, the publisher side, the game development side, the engineering side, right? The, the marketing side, even stuff like my background, which is actually, you know, parallel to the game industry of watching people play video games, the creator economy. And so I think we've got a robust and well-rounded team that can actually really, really support game developers better than anyone else. And I think gaming has been a really fun and probably a good segue here, but I think gaming has been a really fun category within web three that has a lot of promise and potential but hasn't fully come to life at all yet and um i think that's probably one of the more promising verticals personalizing private wealth with titan ceos joe prococo and clay gardner episode 151 gin hits the actual lowering of the functional barriers but then thirdly it also helps them see a part of their future wealth on the other side of this, and Clay, maybe you can answer this. What has been preventing institutional investors from, you know, reaching out and, and trying to build a build a distribution channel with retail? Why do why do these alternative products, why do these alternative managers have trouble raising capital from retail or, or why have they not wanted to raise capital from retail in the past? Beyond what Joe talked about on the on the barriers for retail investors. I would say a couple jump to mind. Joe alluded to the, the tangible constraints right around just minimums <laughs> and frankly, the, the cost benefit analysis, you know, if you whip out a napkin, the quick napkin math is, you know, I'm just going to cherry pick. If you're your tiger global or your Sequoia or your, you know, pick your tier one fund uh, or investment firm. I've heard of these folks anecdotally raising money and, you know, in the, on, on the span of tens or hundreds or if not billions of dollars in a matter of weeks. Right. And so even if you can make a play for, thousands or tens of thousands of retail investors at and somehow figure out how to collect 500, 1,000, $10,000 checks. You're talking about 
significant logistical complexity in terms of collecting the the, the checks, uh, making sure accreditation requirements are met, wiring the funds, handling capital calls, handling handling tax for probably a fraction of the capital. And so traditionally, large institutions say, why would I go down the retail route when the institutional route is easier, cheaper, faster, and much less of a headache? So I think the those constraints, if you believe, if you understand the why this hasn't been done before, you can see a lot of those constraints starting to melt away. And we, Titan hopes to be a big proponent and a big uh, pioneer in helping that happen. So um, check size. We're in the year 2022. I don't think adding a few zeros or removing a few zeros should be the reason an entire swath of investors is locked out of a particular asset class. And that's changing if you have a bunch of different uh, under the hood regulatory uh, structures, uh, whether the registered fund products, SPVs, feeder funds, I won't get into the nitty gritty, but those barriers are falling. And then I would say the second one is one more of Joe alluded to around education, right? I think there's a general bias or stereotype around retail investors, particularly over the last few years with the Reddit, GameStop, kind of Robin Hood madness, that retail investors are quite fickle, that they're quote unquote dumb money, or that they're not sticky, that they're just day trading. We see, frankly, the exact opposite on our platform at Titan. We think the right products in front of the right people with the right education layer, really giving them a direct relationship with the fund manager can transform behavior pretty dramatically. And so I think if you look at, if you're an institution today, you have to go through armies of middlemen, each taking a fee and each removing you steps and steps and steps from the end retail investor, where at the end of the day, whether you're Tiger and Dreesen Horowitz or whomever you are, you know, you're effectively relegated to being a ticker symbol in a portfolio. So of course they're going to trade a fund manager like a stock. So by removing middlemen, by removing a lot of the barriers I alluded to, we hope we can break that stereotype because for where we, we sit on the field today, retail can be an amazing business. Um, and frankly, I think the world needs uh, uh, to remove these barriers as opposed to just, just making wealthy people richer. So. Yeah, maybe you could go a little bit deeper into that when you said kind of removing the middlemen. It seems like that's something that Titan is really um, kind of trying to set out to do, trying to become maybe you know, a platform for, um, you know, other uh, kind of fund managers, maybe to build a brand and do things like that and directly communicate with their investors. Um, how do you do that? How do you enable that kind of direct link? I'll take a simple example, and then I'll pass it to Joe. Joe's actually the chief architect of a lot of the, the user experience they see in the app today that's made this relationship come to life. Let me talk from the institutional investor's perspective, the world that I, I would see if I was going and managing a fund, and then I'll pass it to Joe to sort of articulate like how this looks in the Titan kind of 2.0 world. So if I'm an investment manager today and I want to go to retail, here's the tools that are at my disposal. I have a 90 plus page prospectus, like literally a thick PDF document. Maybe I email it to you. Maybe I mail it to you. I have a fund website where I'm articulating the typical one-year, three-year, five-year track record a bunch of additional documents and disclosures, and probably a chart that shows my historical track record. And then maybe if I'm super, super innovative, I've taken to platforms like Twitter or YouTube, and I've tried to build a brand and a presence there where I can kind of shout at my audience and hopefully they put two and two together. They see recent investments from my prospectus, they hear me talk on YouTube, and they can feel like they're building a relationship with me. So that's the, that's the 1.0 world. If you're an institutional investor with a track record and you want to go to retail, so notice, there's a bunch of different intermediaries, a bunch of platforms, social media and other and onwards that remove me from the end investor. And the 2.0 world looks a lot different. I'll pass the mic to Joe to articulate what, what we see there today. Yeah, the 2.0 world's really exciting. It's um, when you, I, I have this working hypothesis that a lot of the great innovation happens in novel consumer verticals, which then get applied to other legacy verticals, whether it's like finance, insurance, healthcare, and so on. And so what you've seen race ahead in consumer technology is the ability for someone to have a one-to-many audience and build relationships one-to-many. So for example, whether you're Serena Williams or LeBron James, you can effectively have a relationship with millions of people at once. And it's amazing that that technology has yet to permeate into wealth management or investment management. And so it's really exciting when you do that is, as Clay was chatting earlier, they're really, really great iconic managers and asset managers such as ARC, but there are layers and layers of middlemen trying to line up in front of ARC and others to say, I'm in between you and the end retail investor, and you need me to go get access to this. And what you all have started to showcase and what we're all trying to do as well is how do you actually just 
build direct to consumer relationships with tech that can eliminate all the middlemen. So now you can flip from the old world to the new world where let's say you're a manager and let's say you're managing I know, an equity strategy focused on growth tech, you know, ahead of the you know, firm IPO, you can send a, an Instagram stories like video to entire client base for who's ever in your strategy and effectively say, hey, here's the bull case or the bear case on the stock. Um, and that to us is the future of what the wealth management category will look like. No more will you have your investment management tool over here, and then you're going to turn on the TV over there. And you yourself are going to have to try to bridge the information and say, is what CNBC is telling me today on the TV, does that apply to my little app over here in my wealth? When you actually bridge the manager, the end customer, you can then just get content directly. Breaking down biotech innovations with Dr. Bob Langer, episode 156. This isn't one that always comes together so intuitively, but I think it's super interesting. So speaking of companies that have been successful, you're obviously a co-founder of Moderna. So maybe we can talk about mRNA a little bit. I think for starters, for anyone who doesn't know, maybe on the call, I think it'd be good to hear your definition of what is mRNA, just to start pretty simply. And also, we know that this is a pretty ideal solution for the COVID-19 pandemic, as we've clearly seen it play out. It was able to be done really quickly. And also, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus, so it seemed like it was just a match made in heaven. But what do you think mechanistically, or maybe a different reason that you'd like to highlight would make mRNA an ideal candidate for some other type of indication like cancer? Sure. Well, one thing to think about is that protein therapeutics have been incredibly successful. For me, I was fortunate being an advisor to Genetech starting in the 70s. And you can see what's happened with protein therapeutics now. Most of the best-selling drugs in the world are proteins. But it takes a long time to make proteins. You have to make like certain vaccines and eggs, as you know, may take a year. So you're having to guess at what you're going to do, say, in the case of flu. And every protein therapy needs giant cellular reactors and so forth. So there's a central dogma in biology. And that central dogma is that DNA makes RNA, makes protein. So if you could give somebody RNA and do it in an effective and safe way, then you could make protein. Why is that potentially better? Well, one, you can make RNA and figure out the right RNA in a day or two. That's actually what Moderna did in the case of the COVID situation. It really wasn't because that was an RNA virus. It's simply that you knew what the structure of the spike protein was and you could make an RNA against it. So the idea is that it's incredibly faster to do this. You can do it in a day or two to make it and then you put it in nanoparticles and it works. And the reason it works so well is that rather than take a year to make it in eggs or whatever, the body does all the work. You just take a little bit of RNA, put it in a nanoparticle, inject it into the body, and the body will make the protein. Not only does it do that, you can start to treat diseases you never could have treated before, diseases that are intracellular for a basis or membrane-bound for a basis. So it opens up all kinds of additional opportunities. Really, I don't see much limit in terms of what messenger RNA can be used to treat. If you look at what Moderna's pipeline is, there's probably now over 30 different diseases or vaccines being studied in human clinical trials, not just COVID. So there's about nine other vaccines. And by the way, to your question, that even includes personalized cancer vaccines. There was just an announcement yesterday about how Merck and Moderna are working together to come up with personalized cancer vaccines where you could take a patient's cancer, biopsy it, and know what the right, say, antigens are, and then train the body by injecting a vaccine to attack that person's specific cancer, which I think is very exciting. But there's so many others, too cystic fibrosis, rare diseases, heart disease. It's pretty unlimited. So, Bob, thank you for that. This is Charlie. I've got a side question that I'd love to get to if we have time, which is if you'd confess to blowing anything up as a teenager, playing with chemistry, or maybe maybe you want to take that one first before the next serious question. Sure. Well, I'll tell you a story along those lines, Charlie. You know, I remember reading about gunpowder, and my friends and I thought we'd make some gunpowder. I think if I remember correctly, it was sulfur, carbon, and I think it was potassium nitrate. And I had two of those three, but then I kept trying to figure out how to get the other one. And I remember we did make it, but I don't think we compressed it right. 
But a funny story was about 10 years later, you know, when I was an adult, I remember going into a pharmacy and there's this little kid, must have been about eight years old, and he kept asking the pharmacist for one of those chemicals. I think it was potassium nitrate. And so at any rate, he kept asking it. And the guy kept saying, well, why do you want that? Little boy said, I, I just like it. And he must have gone on for about 10 minutes. Of course, I knew exactly why the little boy wanted it. I love it. Well, my dad discovered my own gunpowder plot, literally in one of our outhouses when I was a child, when he went looking for his favorite breakfast bowl, which I had apparently taken. And it was my little stash of charcoal, sulfur, potassium nitrate. And it was just drying when he found his favorite breakfast bowl full of gunpowder. Well, I should have been talking to you, Charlie. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you for that. Back onto the mRNA questions. Do you think there are certain indications that you believe will be very successful in the longer or midterm that you think would surprise others or where others have most pushback or debate? It'd be very interesting to hear. Well, I'm very hopeful that new cancer therapies will be one of them. You know, what I just mentioned, I'm very hopeful that for many reasons, I would love to see these personalized cancer therapies be added to the arsenal of molecules that can be used to treat cancer because it's such a terrible disease. And because I think this idea is a very powerful approach. I mean, there's obviously others too, but that might fit into the criteria that you just gave. Thank you. And do you think there are any areas that almost certainly never will apply as mRNA? Do you think there are any blackouts there? Well, see, to me, let me try to answer it this way. Part of the issue is how well you understand the biology. I was just speaking to a very well-known pharmaceutical company uh, Monday night. They had a board of directors meeting, and they asked if I could speak to them. They're one of the biggest companies in the world. And the chairman of the board said to me, he said, Bob, at Moderna, you guys, you come up with a cure for COVID or a treatment for COVID, the vaccine, in less than a year. How come you or nobody's done that for Alzheimer's? And I said, well, the big issue is, in the case of COVID, you know what the issue is. It's a spike protein. You have a target, and if you block that, you can have a huge effect on the disease. Unfortunately, with Alzheimer's, in my opinion, the biology is not understood. So I think really the answer to your question, which is a great question, is when the biology is reasonably well enough understood, I think mRNA is going to be a great way to treat things. But when it isn't understood, I don't know whether it's mRNA or anything that's going to help you. You really need to understand the biology. Innovation is the ultimate leveler with Steve Case, episode 164. So lots to unpack there. Um, You know, I'm going to give a shout out to St. Pete and the Tampa Bay region generally. I did not know until we moved here that uh, USF, the University of South Florida, is an R1 school, uh, you know, known for its research. Uh, and so that that school is becoming a part of our evolution here and the evolution of a foundation that I set up around education through the lens of innovation, repurposing ARC's research, making it age appropriate. We're already in the Pinellas school system here in the curriculum for sixth grade science. So uh, uh, that's, that's the first thing, uh, giving a, a shout out. Um, I find it also very interesting that in the public markets, unlike the late 90s, when investors were clamoring and just uh, climbing all over each other to get into deals and so forth, now we have investors, and this has been true for the last two years, running for the hills. And what are those hills? They're their benchmarks. So from a behavioral psychology point of view, uh, the, the dynamic today couldn't be more different from the late 90s. And these companies are real, generating real cash flow. And, you know, their profitability, as as we've done our study, is going to be enormous going forward. But they're spending aggressively now, as they should be. I think uh, public companies today, because of short-term oriented shareholders, are afraid to invest too much in R&D or sales and marketing or even stock-based compensation in the early days, thinking that, thinking that their shareholders will, will sell. Uh, so it's, it's a little upside down. The private markets, I think, have it more right in terms of where valuation should be and how much companies should be spending in their early days in order to capitalize on these opportunities. No question. There's a risk when companies go public that they tend to focus more on the 
in the short term. They tend to not, you know, kind of make the long term investments. And we're already seeing some of that in, in this reset happening with, with uh, in the market right now. Some of the large companies, some of the big incumbents in a lot of different sectors uh, are cutting costs and, and laying people off. And, and sometimes that means they, they, they stop some of the innovation initiatives they had internally uh, that could have driven growth down the road. That actually creates an opportunity for the entrepreneurs who, who have more of an opening in those sectors than they did before. And we're seeing that in a lot of these rise of the rest of cities. I also wanted to build on what you said around St. Pete and, and UCSF, USF, the, some of the very best uh, universities in, in the country are places like in Ann Arbor with the University of Michigan or in Phoenix with Arizona State or in uh, Pittsburgh with Carnegie Mellon or in Columbus with Ohio State. I could give you, you know, a dozen others. And historically, they have been magnets for talent. People have gone there and, and gone to you know, school or get PhDs there. But historically, then would leave when they graduated. There was sort of a brain drain because there wasn't enough happening in those cities. And that led them to go to other places, usually the coast, particularly places like Silicon Valley. One of the encouraging thing we've seen in recent years is a little bit of a slowing of the brain drain. More of those people when they graduate are staying in those cities and actually a boomerang of some people returning to uh, some of those cities. That's one of the things I document in the, in the Rise of the Rest book. It's sort of this following the money is one way to, to make investments, but following the talent is probably the better way in the venture capital you know, kind of world where we're seeing where the talent goes. And we're, while Silicon Valley still is the leader of the pack, will continue to be the leader of the pack. People, I think, are going to be surprised what happens over the next uh, phase in terms of how many cities really do rise up. Yeah. And I think you've been an inspiration to the Tampa Bay region. Uh, we're seeing all kinds of innovation centers. We're helping St. Petersburg with an innovation center that will open up, uh, be an incubation center next year. There's Embark Collective, with which Jeff Venick uh, founded. That's a, a private uh, uh, incubation center uh, uh, run by Lakshmi. Uh, she's doing an amazing job there. Uh, and there's just a, this ethos of DNA and excitement and youth that is here. I feel like there's real joy here as well. And, and that, that just to build it, that, that's we were there with our Rise Rest bus in Tampa and St. Pete just a little over three years ago when Embark Collective was still under construction. I did a, a, a fireside chat with uh, with uh, Jeff Vinnick and you know, we had hundreds of people uh, and you could tell something was, was bubbling there. And what you said is until you moved there, you didn't fully appreciate what was happening there. That's the story in all these Rise of the Rest cities. That's really why I wrote the book. I, when I go to these cities, I see things experience things that, I, that surprise me. When people come with us, join us on these bus tours, even people who were from those cities, they're surprised at what's happening, particularly in the startup communities. And so that's when, when people hit the ground and see what's happening, they suddenly say, huh, there's much more happening here in the startup community than I, I thought. There, there, there's, there's a really more reason to be optimistic. Maybe it is time to, to move back to a place that I left before because there was an opportunity before. And, and there, I've heard more and more of those stories in the past decade and certainly more still over the past couple of years during the pandemic. Yeah, I feel, uh, I do feel the optimism, I called it joy, but it's real optimism about the future here that uh, I don't feel in maybe the more established cities uh, around venture, which is which is kind of ironic. They're hungrier. They're 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 fighting. They're fighting to be you know be respected even locally. They're fighting to get more attention nationally, and and that's why we've been focused on this Rise the Rest initiative. Arc believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that Arc believes to be reliable. However, Arc does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from Arc. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.